The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. IntelliFlow is on a mission to give more people access to financial advice. Their technology, IntelliFlow Office, powers and streamlines the advisory experience for over 30,000 financial advisors worldwide, making an impact at every stage of the advice process, including practice management, revenue management, cash flow modelling, client portals and more. IntelliFlow Office helps advisors manage all their client and provider data within a single integrated ecosystem that just works. Discover IntelliFlow for yourself by visiting IntelliFlow.com. Third time such an arm around us with this. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Ben uh, Wrigley. Got the pleasure of speaking with Ben Nelson uh, today, Ben. Thank you for joining me. It feels awfully inauthentic now, doesn't it? Because we've done it so many times. So when it comes out on the podcast, you think it's just flush, but just for the readers or just for the listeners, that we couldn't get that right. This is the third time. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a bit of a hope that it's not coming through in the recording, but will persist. There's going to be some gold in here, so please stick around. Even if the audio isn't 100%. Ben, your, your title on one, I think it's kind of subtitled on LinkedIn at least anyway, it says advisor and researcher. Tell us a little bit about what you're up to. What's the advisor and researcher? Oh, it started at one and it merged into the second, and then I'm hoping to get the second to help the first, so the first is now helping the second. It's a really, it's a, a yin and yang of confusing academic experience, and I don't really know how to title it, so Started in as an advisor, saw a whole bunch, as I'm certain every listener can attest to, of nuances throughout financial planning, throughout the sections, through literally everything. And I was like, there's got to be someone that can address that. There's got to be someone that's willing to put their hand up and do things as opposed to just talk and whinge and do nothing. So I decided to do a PhD through USQ. Um, and the thesis is effectively looking at barriers to accessing financial advice. So there is no scope. It's anything that's slow or that's not consumer focused, or that's not beneficial for financial advice collectively in Australia, I ferociously attack. Yep. <laughs> that's a big project. And different people at different points in time, I'm sure you tried to take little bites of the, the pie, but you're trying to take on the whole thing. Yeah, why not? To, how long have you been doing this? Is the thesis done? You mentioned about publishing it before we started recording. I think for publishing, you need to. Uh, accepted papers. I've okay. done, I think I'm just starting my seventh, and it's just, so I'm doing a, they call it a, a professional studies. So they're only looking for practical outcomes. They're not really looking for contributions to academia. They don't really care about the literature. They want you to find something and implement something that has a practical benefit. So it's right up my alley. Um, so the thesis to me now is just a bunch of administration that I can't really be bothered doing because frankly, I don't care if it's in Times Newman or font 12 I don't care like that just feels like the housekeeping but more importantly we're getting the results from research now which I can use with my peers and my friends to redesign what we do on a day-to-day -day basis um, so it's less about the thesis and the title and more about the practical outcomes that I can share with everyone that I know and well, that's hopefully what we'll dig into a little bit today was it where do we start in terms of the practical applications what have you on where can we, where can we even start? If I can, I try not to keep anything really scripted. So I've got literally five words here. <laughs> it starts with financial literacy. We look down to research. We looked at what we know. Um, then we have our research, which is the process and profit. And then we looked at the outcomes. So if I look at, say, for example, financial literacy, most research publications assume that there is a level of financial literacy. And the challenge to getting that or increasing that is actually accessing financial advice and we'll find now that there's a whole lot of barriers like cost and time and duplication and data collection and whatever else you have and recent studies are actually telling us that there's a spillover effect too so if we get financial literacy at school parents are 67 percent more likely to accept knowledge from their children than they are going looking for it from itself that's extraordinary 
<laughs> Go figure. And that number goes right up if it's a daughter and right down if it's a boy. Yeah, right. Crazy. Um, and so the whole sort of protagonist for this profit process research base was Angelique McInnes, who is mm-hmm. absolutely fascinating and absolutely understated. In 2006, she did a research paper that looked at what we call agency theory, and I'll come back to that in a second. But she deemed because of the financial relationships between licensees and product providers and firms, it was deemed to be what we call illegitimate or a right. conflict because if you're my licensee, you earn more money based on how much money I earn. So the more I earn, the more you get the whole concept. And it's very difficult to depict individualism there, individualism or mm-hmm. anything in defending independence. And so what I was trying to do is trying to decrease the effects of agency theory. Okay. And so I thought that if we can look at our process and find a way to increase the profit, we can actually decrease the influence of agency theory across firms. And it was about three years it took me to figure out that one sentence. (laughs) And so what we did is we went through 134 financial firms located in southeast Queensland, Wide Bay, Darling Downs, Noosa, or Sunshine Coast. We used 67 firms as what we call a control group and then the 67 firms as a sample size. With the first 67, we said we spent a lot of time with them and said, what are you doing? How are you doing it? What part are you doing where? How much profit are you realizing? And what are your advice fees? And for people who listen to podcasts like me, I hate it when there's no practical examples. So when I say that, I mean, where do you do your letter of engagement? How do you do your fact find? What part do you pick up your financial? You know, all those sorts of concepts. And I sort of went, how do we merge those tasks together so that we can get them in one part, we get less time, and we actually pick up parts of the process as opposed to having to go four steps forward and then come three steps back and then go seven steps and whatever. So we got a really good understanding of the data and we used 20 ongoing clients for each firm. And of those 20 ongoing clients, we used five years worth of data. So we ended up with like 13,400 pieces of data to work with. Okay. So it was outrageously overwhelming <laughs> yeah when it started coming in we were all like oh no what do we do here and so we got a really good metric of what we think advice looks like from a, like an existing point of view i'll just bring it up now and then we use that into sort of three subcategories so we had wide back which as a median charges about twenty six hundred dollars for advice and as a median re- uh, realizes about 14 percent profit so 2600 bucks and you're taking home about 380 dollars Seems outrageously low, right? That sure does. Darling Downs was about thirty five, thirty six hundred, and they were taking home about four hundred and sixty bucks. And then the Sunshine Coast charges roughly forty six hundred, so it's about a thousand dollars difference between the three regions. And they were only realizing about six hundred and fifty bucks. And so those 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 average fees that you're talking about is that what a client would pay in the year? That's that's not like an initial fee and an ongoing fee. It's just just on the average cost one. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, we tried it with initial, but it was terrible. It was so low. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Like most of financial services runs are for what we call a loss leader. So they usually don't realize much profit, especially onboarding clients. And even as the research will depict, there's not a whole lot from ongoing relationships either. And then so we used this, this sample size, the 67 firms, and we came back and we said, use this process so we clearly depicted exactly what we wanted to do at each of the six financial planning stages do this here do this here do this here and we realized that a lot of them picked up quite a remarkable amount of profit so y bay was the lowest they picked up nine percent and took their median profit to about 23 percent uh darling downs picked up 15 took their profit up to about 30 percent and the sunshine coats picked up about 22 so it took their profit up to about 40 percent yeah and so you, you, you post you put on LinkedIn was about, you know, is there, like I said, business is operating a profit to begin with, but then is there other means to increase the profitability other than just the client fees? That was kind of the, the gist of the post, wasn't it? Yeah. So in terms of agency theory, if we increase the fees, it doesn't do anything for the relationship. It just puts more burden on the client and ourselves because then it makes the portfolio look worse if we're taking more and the, the returns don't change. Um, So we really wanted a way to breach that concept. So by realizing more profit, but not necessarily introducing any more fees, we are less influenced or impacted by 
what our license is, we'll say. Because okay. if you're like terrible example, but if you earn a hundred gram and you have no profit and your license says do this, you are absolutely gonna do that. Whereas you earn a hundred grand and you have fifty grand profit and they say do this, you kinda got you've got enough time to say, Well, hang on, let's do that. Or maybe even potentially let's look at moving our licenses or whatever need be, because we need less influence. Yeah. Otherwise it's evident in some of our advice pieces. Yeah. Can you talk us through some of those changes that you spoke about at the you know, the different stages? What hoping you're gonna ask those little things. So like two or three practical examples like so whatever FAS you're calling themselves now, uh, they say that we need consent prior. And most of the officers are still struggling with that because most of us have an appointment and say, Do we like each other? Yes or no. Yep. Fifteen minutes or whatever. And then we have to transfer that information, right? So Ben likes James. James is going to become a client. I need to tell someone in the office that the initial fee is X or the ongoing fee is Y. I need to get a lot of information to that person to start that letter, get that consent, and then that needs to get released to you. Now, little things like that, like the transfer of information and the prep of those forms and the passing it to you and the follow-up, and then when we get it and it's signed, we have to put it somewhere. It has to go into our CRM or to your file or to something. And little inefficiencies like that had massive effects. So then we, we get this form back and all of a sudden we've got to start a fact find. So then there's parts in that form that have to go into the fact find. And what we find is that we're really duplicating a lot of information. And so what we did is had uh, the, the whole reason this started was like, if I put something anywhere, that should be it. That should be the source of truth. So it should know that I picked that up there, 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 and there. And so between that, like not having three different appointments for a fact find or making sure that whatever needs to be done in terms of like releasing authorities across seven or eight different platforms is done in one step as opposed to seven steps to three different people. So we just went down and we thought we looked for problematic themes and we found if you were doing things more than once or twice, we put them in one spot and we gave that a title. So fact find. You don't move on fact find until you've got a driver's license, a KYC, a anti-money laundering, a letter of engagement, super statements, bank statements, everything else you need for advice there so that way you're not stopping and coming back. And we did that everywhere and it was remarkably easy. And some of the feedback that we got as well because advisors, quote, wasted time to learn new process, they're actually quite, uh, what's the word? Um, They were quite, I don't want to talk ill of them. Let's just say they were quite invested in, because they'd spent this time to learn it, they were like, that's absolutely going to work because I've wasted time to learn it, so I'm going to make it work. Yeah. (laughs) It has to work. Put all this time and effort into it. It can't not work. So how do you keep how do you keep those like those guardrails of sports? Okay, there's certain steps, and do I put it in there? You're not moving on to the next thing unless you've got one, two, three, four, five. Is that just about being regimented in your processes, or is there do you have a like a system for it? Your CRM, you know, you've got stages in your CRM or something, and you can't this next before you've completed the. the prior step effectively yeah I right. bring this car around ours does that but it's it's limited to our licenses so we did the same thing with word and then during Word, we just did the visibility so i was a bit of a nazi and sort of came in and said you haven't done this here we need this thing here to be done here and after a few iterations they got it and then we had a little checkbox as well so eventually they were the drivers of their own destiny but yeah in a perfect world your crm wouldn't let you move until you have this thing and there'll be context around it why can't I move this? Oh, because there's seven subsections of the Corporations Act that'll put you in jail if you move that without doing that. Understood. Yep. Got it. That'll, that'll do it. Yeah. We found as well there was huge psychological benefits because the process is so well defined that you know what needs to happen. So anytime anything comes up, depending on what step it is, you inadvertently know what it is. So if something comes up at research my mind, I know exactly what I've done. The only thing that can come up is that I need to get a, a one-off approval for a, a product or a fund or a security, whatever it needs to be. So you actually know it's not just an email. You know roughly what it's going to be based on what you receive back. Gotcha. So what what else do you, did you have any other tips other than like this kind of this regimented process that it was helping with, with profitability? Anything else that you identified? That was a that's it. Process and inter-office communications. So we found a couple of things that advisors, one being one as well, so I'm not trying to offend anyone, but advisors pass tasks across. And when you do that, 
hypothetically, if I send something to you, it takes me six minutes and then it sits in your inbox for two hours and then it takes you six minutes and then you send it back. So we found that we were losing a lot of time. Yep. And so we developed ways whereby if information was put into the fact find, we needed it to be put straight into the CRM. So we wrote codes and stuff for that. And that way it was almost like a support person for you. So you wrote it once and that was it. So that second and third task, I'm assuming everybody's already thinking of things that they say now, like certified driver's license, got it. We still need to put that somewhere and call it something. And so we just removed those other two steps. Mm-hmm. And we did this across literally everything that I could do. Yeah. And so is this, this software, you put coding in it, it's just your license. In a perfect world, yes. But the one that we used for the research was just Word. Could it needed to be applicable for everything? Yeah. So what what is your financial planning business look like then? So you're spending a whole lot of time doing all this research. I, I would imagine you're influencing a lot of what you're uncovering as part of the research into your financial planning business. Can you talk us through what your financial planning business looks like? Oh, I feel really sorry for my clients because they've got no choice either. But I just said, do you want to do this thing? And they're like, no. And I was like, well, guess guess what we're doing <laughs> are, they, are they somewhat guinea pigs for your research oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and they got to sign a bunch of stuff um so we're we're a bit uh, lucky because we're top heavy we've got a lot of retiree and post-retire pre-retiree guys that are just quite well off um mm-hmm. not much risk so in terms of financial advice it's not too hard we just got a lot of platforms and a lot of um old farm so it's probably somewhere around the 170 ongoing client mark yeah and because of that, um, we're still not charging like our medium fee would be say probably three grand. Yeah, okay. Like it's not a huge it's just because we focus on the other end of the processes, we can get the advice delivered so much faster. Yep. I mean, so so what does then I guess you're are there any other advisors in the business or is it just you? And and what does the rest of the support for operating a business look like? Ironically, it's just one. So it's Colleen and I, we've been working together for 10 years now. And because of the process, it's so well defined that we can rock and roll like nothing before. Um, but the next steps look like uh, our licensee have offered what we call a, a corporate AR agreement. So they're going to view several businesses as one. And because of that, we have a complementary service whereby we can introduce everything that my research has found across different businesses and hopefully facilitate the increase of their profit as well. So they can effectively become many versions of what we do and become insanely profitable at a lower client point. Yep, incredible. It's just you and one other person, 170 clients, and now you're looking to roll out a lot of what you're doing to to others in the network. Yeah. And because of the guided theory, like we call it nudge, if you get off track, the system will nudge you back to where it needs to be. It will inadvertently do that thing. And because of that, like we can see visibility as well. So you sign something and we can have a bit of a look and make sure that you're on the right track and whatnot. But for me, this is a necessary change because if we fast forward 10 years and we say, what are we paying now? Do we think we're going to pay that in 10 years with 10 more CPI increases? I think the resounding response will be a no. So something needs to change with financial planning. Otherwise, you're going to struggle to have relevance both from a, like a byproduct of what a statement of advice is and also the arrangement. Like it's becoming expensive. And if I look at, say, a new entrant, it's going to be increasingly difficult for you and I to start up in 10 years because the cost is such a barrier. And so if we haven't got the corporate hub or if you haven't got someone that you can sort of sidle in business with and grow yourself up to you're at the point where you can step out again, it's going to be very, very hard for new entrants to come in. Mm. Do you do medics expensive on the side of like the, the fees that we charge to the advice or just like the salaries uh, within advice as well? Is it a combination of both? Well, mate, so like, so not that I'm taking a shot or anything, but the cost to be an advisor. Mm. We've got an ASIC levy. I don't really know why. We have licensees fees, especially when you're green, you've got power planning. Mm. To be an advisor, considering you have no clients, I struggle to think of any license that would offer that for, say, less than 40 grand. Mm. Like Dover was the good one 10 years ago and what happened there? Yeah. So in order to start now, if I look at someone coming out of university, your options are very limited. And if we look at research and statistics tells us that most of the guys in Y Bay are only actually realizing about 14% of their profit on, say, four or 500 grand, there's not a lot of space there to fund a graduate. Yeah. Absolutely not. And so if I look at, say, 10 years and four or five people come out of uni and they say, what's my prospects? You say, very slim. 
<laughs> uh, so we, how do we change it all? Or is it, or is that all kind of crux of your research? Do we become more profitable businesses, not needing to increase the fees, but there's other changes to make it more profitable, and then it's more attractive to younger entrants and all the rest of it. Because on, on the other hand, we hear all of the, you know, there's this huge wave of people going to turn 65 over the next little while. There's going to be huge demand for advice and all the rest of it. But then at the same time, yeah, there's a whole lot of businesses that aren't terribly profitable. How do, how do we manage that? Or do people just suck it up and just run businesses that are only running at 14% profit? What would you do? <laughs> do the podcast or Yeah. Yeah. What would I do is, I suppose this is something that I'm grappling with myself at the moment. I think what, what I guess what people have done in the past is you, is you end up being really narrow for a certain number of clients, for a certain demographic of clients, and you charge them a lot of money for that for that advice. Mm-hmm. Far more than $3,500 a year in the hope that that drives the profitability and then you can afford to employ more people and you can build and you can grow from there if that's what the operation is. Mm. But th- that's what we've done the whole time. But your research, as much as people might be aspiring to that, it's only 14 because their profit is dropping at the bottom end. Crazy, isn't it? So I treat it like a case. What would I do if a client came in and said these exact parameters to us? And it's a collection of acting smarter and moving smarter and being literate yourself. So what do we want? And then also addressing your costs. So how do we reduce costs if they're not necessary? And also how do we bring more people in with either skin on the game or a skin, you know, that, what can we do? And the, the options, unfortunately, now are very, very limited. So what we need to consider is how do we either merge businesses or buy businesses or fund new entrants? But as it stands, which is quite interesting because McInnes told us this eight years ago, things need to change. There's a lot of businesses that are looking at, I don't know a lot of but just different people that I speak to over, over time, that are um, single practices, you know, it's all too hard to operate on my own. And, and there's a lot more to it and it's all too hard, obviously. Do you see that as a viable business model going forward? Or, or do you think they're all going to be degree of consolidation to help with it all the only reservation with that is the accountability so if we merge into you Mm -hmm. you're accountable for me so with the 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 hub arrangement that we're talking with at the moment you'll still have your individual accountability so you could be treated as say i don't know nielsen rightly hub and if you do something naughty then that's your fault whereas if but if you've still got that you can consolidate your costs and then not behooven to anyone so, like, that's effectively the mark of a true profession. It doesn't matter if you and I are doctors and we do something naughty at different hospitals. It's our fault, not the hospital's fault. Yep. And the, the faster we move towards a model like that, the quicker we can reduce a heck of a lot of the cost because then it's not in focus. Or, sorry, it's not our licensee's fault that we did something wrong. It's mine. Yep. And it feels like a very far out concept, but this has been happening for hundreds of years. <laughs> and it feels like Australian financial planning is only just catching up. I was talking to someone at the ensemble on PD day that was on a few weeks back now up in Sydney, and a, a large someone was talking about this idea of yeah that you know, um that actually kind of got their own license, but it was more more maybe five independent financial planning businesses that were all operating on their own license. This this kind of idea of like you about it. So each of those four or five different businesses had had a different responsibility related to the operations of the license, but they had their own license. They had some degree of shared services, I believe, but yeah, operating is a, is a little hub. So each individual has had its own profit or loss state, did its own thing, its own way, shared responsibility for this license as a, as a little hub, as you're referring to. Uh, an interesting way of setting things up to explore, I would think. Mm. So that's effectively what we're looking to design at the moment. But with the support of a license, yep, which is fantastic because if I look at the costs, you still don't want to spend a million dollars developing your own CRM. So if you can line up with someone who's already got those facilities in place and literally just bring in new business, it all works. And that changes absolutely everything. Yeah. Interesting way forward for those that are considering getting out of being on their own and joining someone bigger. Maybe this idea of teaming up with others and forming their own little heart as you you thought. Mm. And you have a cohort of four or five officers that do what you do or are complementary to your services, so you can sort of retain where you need to retain. And the big thing for us with that is that you can introduce students. You can bring them in in a cost-effective manner, and they are your succession plan. And would those students be 
a shared resource across the whole, or would they be tied to one particular business or another? When we were talking about it, we decided to share them on the pretense that if you can give them, say, for example, the three with us, three different learnings. So if you learn just for me, I create another me, which is hypothetically not good or bad, but I've got my own limitations. Whereas if you do two other people, that student gets three more influences. So you're actually developing the person a bit more as well, which is rather unique. Yeah, absolutely. Which I guess maybe leads on to the next bit that I want to talk about and, and one of your more recent posts on LinkedIn. You're asking for more advisors to to be involved in sitting in on your meetings and interactions with clients we, uh, to critique you, provide some feedback. Can you talk us through what that's all about? Well, I guess he's anyone called the for and, and what you're hoping to achieve, Paul. Yeah, I'm really excited about this one, mate. So there's 44 advisors that have volunteered so far. Oh, really? It's only days or so ago that posted up. Yeah, like a lot of the weirdos just sent messages as opposed to, like, I was going to make a, another comment saying the correlation between likes and comments is stupidly low here, guys. We look, we want input, not just. But yeah, so there's 40 odd. Yeah. And what I'm hoping to do, like, if I look at other standard or accepted professions, they always have an assessment criteria. They say the lawyer is doing this or isn't doing this, thus this is the area that needs development. With financial planning, that doesn't exist. So I don't know if I'm good or bad. I I don't know if what I'm doing is right or wrong. And so what I've done is gone through the literature and found seven subcategories of professionalism with financial planning, with regulatory, with behavioral finances. And I'm hoping to do what we call a like art scale and then write sub-questions with that And then what I want is for someone like you to watch me with these clients and these interactions and record it depending on whatever. I mean, that makes the most sense because then everybody can. And then literally give you a framework for feedback and say, what did James think of Ben during this interaction? And then I'm going to use your feedback to further define this assessment criteria. And then I'm literally going to take it to ASIC and say, here's exactly what we need to run every so often to make sure that your advisors are doing what they should be doing. And it's impartial because it's peer Right, so I've got. I don't owe you anything, and vice versa. So if you think I'm bad, you can say it, and that way we're holding each other accountable. That's the next step towards professionalism. We'll recognise professionalism. It, but it, in the this is the whole professional year that your advisors have to go through anyway. But here in the past, before professional even existed, we would have you know younger people, associate advisors, or whatever, kind of sit in on those meetings and and learn and start talk to the clients and start to engage with the clients and then we, we kind of critique them afterwards but so it's, it's, it's doing that that I'm sure other businesses are doing as well but on a larger scale just giving a framework for everyone to be held accountable to for want a better description. How amazing and then you can take so many of those things away so you don't have to be so rigorous with your audit because audits really just look at your document. You can actually develop yourself personally. I've got a mate who's recently got off the program and he's now a pediatrician and he said that he had to go to a hotel where three old surgeons just critiqued the heck out of him. So they said, hi, your patient's done this. What do you do? And so he, blah, 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 blah. And then they said, boom, this is happening. What are you doing now? And they just hit him. And they pushed his buttons and they tried to wind him up. And Ben said, you have to be cool, calm, collect. You just have to respond. And then he said, I got up, didn't say a word, went to another room, another scenario. So they had it for three days, three different times. And then he got an email a week later saying, congrats, you passed. Obviously, that's a lot more severe than financial planning, but why aren't we moving towards a model like that? So just because like the downside that I see with PY is that they only know what I know and I only know what I'm willing to accept. So if you tell me you should do this, I say, shut up, James. But this, or I choose to feed, I choose to take it on. And if I don't take it on, I shouldn't be teaching anyone. Yeah, and that, and that's because uh, you, you're all like, Someone coming to my meetings, and my meetings only a more direction they become a mini James. That might be good, that might be bad. Um, but yeah, the interaction with others. I'm surprised if, you, if you're working in a, in a larger business or you know, new entrants into financial advice and happy to be working in a larger business, there might be the opportunity to go to different meetings and learn from different people and different styles. But there aren't that many terribly big financial planning businesses around anymore when it happen. It's all kind of splintered off into fairly small businesses all over the place. Uh, the way there might only be one or two advisors you know, involved in the business. So this, this framework would be fantastic. Especially if you're coming in too. Like if we get taught a certain way and then we go to buy a business, we only know what we know. So I did it a couple of years ago. I bought one at Rockhampton. 
And I walked in and said, how much do you want? And he said, X. And I said, great, done. That was it. Like, it seemed like a good price. Yeah. Whereas now, if you're just like, never. You go through documents, you go through advice, you go through absolutely because of what I know and because of how much the world's changed. But I'm very lucky we managed to make that one work. <laughs> He's going to say, how, how did they go shopping? <laughs> So the whole thing is self-development. The whole thing is accountability. Like if we want to be recognized as a profession, we need to start acting like one. And we can. There's nothing stopping us. And every conversation I've had with ASIC, is, admittedly, there isn't a lot, but they are all for development. Never once have they said, no, no, we don't, we don't want to do that. We don't really like you. They're like, if you want to grow, you grow. Don't let us stop you. What's next for, what's next for Ben? Do you plan on continuing to wear two bats? He's kind of researching and changing the way that we do things as well as operating a business or is, is you know there has been a bit more focus on the thesis just on the pretense that we're trying to have children as well so as soon as that's done um then i really want to focus on this assessment criteria and get as much feedback as i possibly can to everybody listening please help and then i think i'm going to make active steps towards realistically pushing financial advice in australia towards a recognized profession it seems biased and i'm willing to fight anyone on this but i think if we get that title a lot of our red tape will drop like if we are recognized and we have systems and ethics review boards and everything in place, we won't need as much from our licensees. We won't need as much. And if we can change the accountability from, say, licensees or someone to someone to someone to Ben, to Ben, then all of a sudden we're going to be a bit clearer with what it is that we're saying. Yep. And if we can mix that in with increasing our profits or increasing our process by our profits, we take a big step towards not official independence, but towards developing the sector, which has massive flow on effects like perception, profit, most importantly is relevance. Because if you look and say you or my generation or the one underneath us, there's 0% chance, obviously that's not an actual statistic, but there's 0% chance that Gen Z is going to read an 85-page SOA document. It's not happening. Yeah, exactly. If we don't take the steps to change it now, we might as well all sell. Yeah, your, your research and your process and stuff most of work because I'm still stuck on if you're running 100 you got a client business with 170 clients there's one other person <laughs> doing all of this research stuff at the same time I feel like I don't have time for anything and uh, how are you doing it so there's proof in it just in itself incredible well thanks Ben if anyone wants to get involved with um, your research and the critiquing and stuff where can people find you where can I reach out to you oh LinkedIn easiest I like LinkedIn too because you can see if I've seen it. <laughs> There's no hiding. I don't know. I don't know. It was looking me the other night. Have they taken off that feature where you could see who'd looked at your profile? It's like the only social media platform where you can see or you can see if someone's actually looked at you. So you've got to be careful with the walking that you might do because they, uh, they'll know that you've been looking at your page. And I'm happy. So this has gone through, um, I think, two rounds of revision. So it should soon be published. Happy to send it through to everyone. If not, I'll bang it through LinkedIn. You can look at that. We're happy to talk to people as well about how to implement some of these changes, which is going to be the big next thing. So if we can take anyone's profit, including yours, anyone's profit margin from bloody 14 to 50 or 14 to 40, that's a pretty sizable response from a smaller financial planning firm. So like, why not grab it? Absolutely. And thank you for your time. Everyone reach out. Grab that paper once it's published. Sounds like it's going to be gold. Great to chat with you. User. I grab yourself. Thanks.